First, I'm going to uh, briefly take you through some of the highlights of science that bear upon philosophical and theological issues. The, the great trend of science over the centuries has been to enlarge the domain of what we call the physical universe and to offer material explanations for everything in the physical universe. And uh, then I'm going to turn to religion. I'm going to talk about the, the different ways that science and religion view the world, the different kinds of knowledge and science and religion, the different ways that knowledge is obtained in science and religion. I'll draw some demarcations between the two and talk about uh, the compatibility of the two. And along the way, I will uh, argue that a spiritual universe exists alongside the physical universe. So I'm going to start with biology. A, a long-standing debate in biology, in fact one that is not fully resolved today, is between uh, two camps, we, we can call them the mechanists and the vitalists. And the mechanists believe that all uh, living creatures, including human beings, are completely explainable in terms of the laws of physics, chemistry, and biology. Um, that we are basically a set of, of pulleys and weights and springs. And the vitalists feel that in addition to all of that, there is some um, unseen, invisible essence that makes living creatures alive. It, it might be called the soul, it might be called the spirit. Sometimes it supplies the energy of the body. Aristotle and Plato were vitalists. Descartes was a vitalist. Um, probably the, the first modern mechanist was Spinoza. And for those of you who know the philosophy of Spinoza, you're not surprised to hear that he was a mechanist. In the 19th century, this physicist and physician, Julius Mayer, proposed that the energy consumed by a living being is completely supplied by the food that it eats. There's nothing more mysterious. It's just a simple equation. And this German physiologist, Max Rubner, um, actually proved Mayer's conjecture. He carefully measured the amount of energy that, that the body uses in, in all mechanical things, running, exercise, also in metabolic activities like sweating, and compare that to the calories actually eaten by food, the energy supplied by food, and found that yes indeed, the energy that we use in living is completely supplied by the food that we eat. An even greater step towards the mechanist view of the body was the discovery of the structure of DNA in the early 1950s by Watson and Crick and Rosalind Franklin in which the, in, the particular mo molecules that were responsible for sending the instructions uh, to make a new living organism are encoded within us. Here, for example, is, is, a, is a strand of DNA and each of those letters stands for a particular molecule that is like a letter of the alphabet that has a code and spells a word. That string of letters actually tells the, the body how to make nine amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein. And all of DNA works like this. Um, I am pretty sure that with, within 100 years that we will be able to build a human being from scratch. Uh, we can already make viruses we will be able to put together, uh, manufacture in the lab the DNA of a human being. We, we will be able to surround that with the, the various chemicals, uh, the uh, chemical elements that go into making protein and fat and so on, and, and step back and let the DNA do its work. Um, I think this is only 100 years off, or at the most, 200 years off. Well, the mind, the brain, might be one of the last holdouts of the vitalists. Of course, we still don't understand exactly how the brain works, but we do know a lot about it, and we know that um, 
the, all of the thinking is done in about 100 billion neurons, each that have uh, connections to 1,000 other neurons. There is a biologist at Harvard, Florian Engert, who has actually been able to measure the electrical change of single neurons when the animal learns something. So we really are able to, to actually trace learning and memory and decision making to the electrical and chemical activities of individual neurons. I think all of this will uh, reach an ultimate point within a hundred another hundred years from now we will be building creatures that are part human and part machine. Uh, we will have computer chips implanted in our brains that hook us directly to the internet so you don't even have to have your iPhone um, you will be connected to other minds directly from your mind to theirs, theirs through the internet. Our, our eyes will be improved, uh, part machine-like. We'll be able to see infrared and x-rays. We will be part machine and part human. It's only a matter of time. Well, let me move from biology now to physics. I told you this is going to be a very, very brief tour of some of the highlights. One of the earliest physicists in my view is Lucretius. Um, he, he, he was, most people consider him a poet. I consider him a physicist. He wrote a wonderful book called The Nature of Things in which he explained uh, everything in the world in terms of atoms. Uh, he borrowed some from the earlier Greek thinkers. Uh, atoms were tiny, they were indestructible. Atoms could be neither created nor destroyed. The atoms were here forever. And Lucretius explicitly states in his, in his poem that one of the results of this atomic hypothesis is that the gods no longer have power over us because they can't create and destroy things out of nothing. Everything is made out of atoms, and atoms are indestructible. Uh, Lucretius believed in a pantheon of gods, but he felt that the atomic hypothesis, hypothesis freed us from the actions of the gods. One of the great contributions of physics to science is the idea of a law of nature. This idea is that all of nature, or I should say the physical universe, obeys laws. You can't have random things happening like wheelbarrows suddenly floating in the air. There are rational laws. Those laws are um, quantifiable. They're usually expressed in mathematical terms. And most importantly, they are discoverable by human beings. They're not known only by the gods. They are discoverable by human beings. One of the first physicists to propose a quantitative law of nature was Galileo. I consider Galileo the first modern scientist. And in the next slide, we see a law that he made called the law of falling bodies. You notice that if you drop a ball or anything, it goes faster and faster the longer it falls. So that means it covers greater and greater distance in the same increment of time. So for example, if the ball falls one foot in a second, in two seconds it will fall four feet, in three seconds it will fall nine feet, nine feet. So the law that Galileo found was that the distance that it falls is proportional to the square of the time, a quantitative mathematical law that Galileo proposed. And of course the question arises, does this law of falling bodies apply everywhere in the universe and not only in Galileo's laboratory. And here, people were fighting against the old Aristotelian notion that the heavens are made out of different kind of material and obey different laws than what we have on Earth. As you might remember, Aristotle composed the universe out of five elements. There was earth, air, water, and fire for everything terrestrial. But for the heavens, the stars and the planets and the heavenly body, Aristotle proposed a fifth element, the ether, which was indestructible and divine. And in the next slide, uh, one of the nearest divine bodies, the sun, certainly appears perfect, a uh, perfect sphere. So uh, we can sort of understand how 
how Aristotle felt that the heavens, those, those beautiful distant stars, and the sun were made out of different kinds of stuff than what we have on Earth, were divine, were eternal. But Galileo, with his new telescope, found sunspots on the sun. These are actually magnetic storms, but they're, they're spots that you can see with a telescope so that the heavenly bodies have blemishes. They're no longer perfect. So this was the beginning of our understanding that the heavens are made out of the same kind of stuff that we have on Earth. Um, this idea was, was brought to its greatest fruition by Isaac Newton who I think was one of the, the greatest scientists of all time, except for uh, Albert Einstein. And Newton um, incorporated Galileo's law of falling bodies into a more general law of gravity. And what Newton proposed is that the same gravity that causes an apple to fall from a tree also causes the planets to orbit the sun. That is, there is a universal law of nature that applies everywhere in the universe. And so by the, end, by the beginning of the 20th century, um, physics had brought us to the point of understanding and believing that everything in the cosmos is, is made out of the same stuff and obeys the same laws of nature. Well, let me finish with a couple of comments on astronomy before I go to religion. Of course, one of the, the greatest dogmas and traditions in astronomy was that the Earth is at the center of the universe. There is humanity on Earth, the planets and, and the sun orbit the Earth, the angels and the demonic beings are out there beyond the Earth, and this was the view that held sway for a long time, and it's, it's very logical after all, when we look up we see everything orbiting around the Earth, so this is a natural view. Then the Polish astronomer Copernicus proposed that it is the sun, not the earth, that is the center of our solar system. And that began a movement away towards us human beings being the center of things, vast philosophical implications. And one began to ask the question, how long has the universe existed? Um, Aristotle believed that the universe was permanent, uh, unchanging, that had, li had, had li lasted forever, all the way back infinitely in time. Einstein also believed in an unchanging and permanent universe that had lasted forever. This idea of a permanent universe, which was once in the area of philosophy and, and theology, became an area of science when um, an American astronomer named Edwin Hubble found evidence that the universe is expanding, that it's not static. Hubble used this telescope to do his work, a 100-inch diameter telescope in California, and looking at the galaxies, he, he saw evidence that the galaxies are actually moving away from each other. Everything is expanding. And if you imagine going back into the past, if everything's expanding now, that means everything was closer together in the past. And by measuring the rate at which the universe is expanding today, we can calculate how far in the past all of the matter of the universe was crammed onto itself in a region as small as an atom. And that's about 13 and a half billion years ago. That is, we can calculate using scientific measurements when the universe began. Uh, that's a mind-blowing concept, a mind-blowing result. It also, that, that number of 13 and a half billion years also agrees with our dating the ages of individual stars, with measuring uh, the age of the Earth by radioactive the decay of rocks. And that became part of what we call the Big Bang model we have been able to quantify our understanding of the history of the universe from t equals zero 13.5 billion, billion years ago until now. Now in this graph I've shown, this is the only graph that you're going to see all night. That's the temperature graphed against time. This is one second after the Big Bang. This is one ten billionth of a second after the Big Bang. 
So every time I go back one notch, I'm dividing the time a 10 billion times smaller. This is when the first atomic nuclei were formed. This is when the first planets were formed. This is now. We can calculate using physics all the way back here to this blue region, much smaller to a time when the universe was much less than one second old. That's chutzpah. <laughs> and, and right now, physicists are working on what happened in that blue area there. Here's a contemporary paper in cosmology published just in July where some leading physicists are working on what happened just a hair's breadth after t equals zero. They're calculating way back into that blue region and they're using mathematics like this to calculate. This is quantitative stuff. We know we're not whistling in the dark. So what came before t equals zero? Well, we don't know. Um, and there's no way that we can ever know for sure. We have hypotheses. And our hypothesis is something like this, that before t equals zero, before the Big Bang, there were lots and lots of other universes with different properties. Some of them had three dimensions like ours, some of them had 17 dimensions, some had 28 dimensions, and they were all trying to come into existence. And the ones that had the right properties, like our universe, started expanding and had the right conditions for life to form. Well, I think it now is a good time to turn to religion. <laughs> I want to start off by suggesting that there are some areas where science and religion intersect, where there are questions uh, that sort of legitimately fall within the domain of the two. I think the question of what created the universe is one such question, or the laws of nature that I mentioned earlier, like Galileo's law of falling bodies, are they sufficient to explain everything in the physical universe? There are questions like, do we have free will, which falls within neuroscience? We believe that our decisions are made by neurons. Those neurons are electrical and chemical. Science obeys cause and effect. That means a thought that you have now, the condition of a neuron in your brain, was determined by what it was doing a second ago, which was determined by what it was doing a second before that. So you can trace everything back to the conditions of neurons in the past. Do we have any free will at all, or is it all predetermined by cause and effect and the laws of, of science? There are also questions where I feel that science and religion have separate domains. I think ethics and morality fall fully within the domain of religion. I think that scientists have no more wisdom than anyone else on questions of ethics and morality. Uh, I think the meaning of life is something that science can never answer. That's, that's a, if it has any answer at all, that's a question for religion. The existence of God is a question for religion. I'll have more to say about that uh, a little bit later. I think the nature of the physical universe on the other hand, falls completely within the domain of science. Well, is there a kind of religious belief that would be completely compatible with science? Um, this is a question I've, I've asked myself for years, and I want to propose uh, an answer to it. And to do that, first I'm going to uh, discuss something that I call the central doctrine of science. Uh, Almost all scientists subscribe to the central doctrine of science, whether they explicitly and consciously acknowledge it or not. And the central doctrine of science says that, that all of the phenomena in the physical universe can be explained by the, by the laws of nature, and that those laws of nature hold everywhere and at all times, with no exception. Well, to make the next step, um, I apologize for this, but I have to put forth a working definition of God. Um, if God exists, I don't think any of us know what his or her qualities are, but I want to propose a definition, uh, sort of a minimal definition, that will work for our discussion and I think is upheld by every religion that I know of. And the working definition of God is that God is a being 
who lives outside of time and space and is not restricted by the laws of nature. And I believe that every religion has this kind of understanding of God. So having given that background, um, I would propose that science and religion are compatible only if God does not intervene in the physical universe to violate the laws of nature. Otherwise, God would be violating the central doctrine of science. Um, and note that it is not necessary to deny the existence of God for this compatibility. It's only that God must not intervene in the physical universe once the universe has been created. Otherwise, the central doctrine of science would be violated. Most religions do not have God of this type. That is, in most religions, God does intervene to perform miracles. In Judaism, for example, just to name one of many examples, there are the ten plagues on Egypt. In Islam, there's the splitting of the moon by Muhammad, which is described in the Quran. In Hinduism, there are the many visitations on earth of the reincarnations of Vishnu and the other Hindu gods that uh, monkey around with the affairs on earth. So, according to the, to the strict logic that I have just enunciated, most religions are not compatible with science, at least in their orthodox form. But what I want to say now is when you look at the, the real beliefs of real people, the situation is much more complicated than what I have laid out. It's not nearly so logical. Um, there are many non-scientists, um, which is most of us, who believe in an intervening God who performs miracles and yet also appreciate the value of science. Um, after all, all of us, uh, whenever we get in an airplane and fly somewhere, we're putting our faith in the laws of physics to keep the airplane aloft. We're, we're literally putting our, our life in the hands of science. And on the flip side of the coin, there is a small but vocal group of scientists, I would say about 5%, who believe in an intervening God, a God that forms miracles from time to time. This is Ian Hutchinson, who's a, pro a professor of nuclear science at MIT. And Professor Hutchinson said the following thing to me uh, about a year ago, and I'm quoting. The universe exists because of God's actions. What we call the laws of nature are upheld by God, and they are our description of the normal way in which God acts in the world. I do think miracles take place today and have taken place over history. I take the view that science is not all the reliable knowledge that exists. The evidence of the resurrection of Christ, for example, cannot be approached in a scientific way. Here's Owen Gingrich, a professor of astronomy at Harvard, and this is what Professor Gingrich said to me. These guys are in the 5%. <laughs> I believe that our physical universe is somehow wrapped within a broader and deeper spiritual universe in which miracles can occur. We would not be able to plan ahead or make decisions without a world that is largely law-like. The scientific picture of the world is an important one, but it is, does not apply to all events. So devoutly religious scientists like Hutchinson and, and Gingrich, they reconciled their belief in science with their belief in an intervening God by adopting a worldview in which science and the laws of nature apply most of the time. But now and then, God intervenes and violates the laws of nature.
And these exceptional actions by God cannot be analyzed in any scientific way. So the situation is very interesting when you look at the beliefs of real people. It's not nearly as neat as what I laid out. So I wanted to talk a little bit now about the different kinds of knowledge in science and religion and the way that we go about obtaining those, the, the knowledge. And a couple of the key differences between science and religion regarding knowledge are, first of all, that we have measurement and proof and science, and in religion we have faith. And we have the impersonal in science, whereas we have the personal in religion. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that. What are the kinds of knowledge that we have in science? Well, we, 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 we have the properties of physical objects, and then we have the laws that those physical objects obey. Take this golf ball, for example. It's an object in the physical world that exists outside of our bodies. We can take a, a ruler and measure its diameter to be so many inches. We can take a scale and weigh it to so many ounces. We have these numbers, th these physical properties that were measured by instruments outside of our bodies. And if we drop this golf ball or, or throw it, it, it follows Galileo's law of falling bodies. So that's a law that the golf ball behaves. Well, how did Galileo go about discovering that law? Galileo, back in the late 1500s and early 1600s, took a, a board and built an inclined plane like this and started rolling lots of balls of different masses down the board and measured how long it took them to fall various distances. Um, now, Galileo was a very, very smart man, but he was not smart enough to build that clock, that watch that I have there. <laughs> he actually used a swinging pendulum to measure time. But Galileo wrote all this down in his notebook, and he found a pattern. And that pattern was the law of falling bodies, that the distance is proportional to the square of the time. Well, a little bit later, Galileo's law of falling bodies was incorporated into, Newton, into Newton's more general theory of gravity. And then in the 19th century, uh, Newton's theory of gravity worked very well ex explaining orbits of planets and so on. But in the 19th century, astronomers noticed they measured the orbit of the planets very, very precisely. And they noticed that the orbit of Mercury, that planet, didn't follow Newton's law exactly. And then Einstein came along and put forth his theory of gravity. Uh, by the way, you're all going to be quizzed on these equations after the lecture. <laughs> and, and Einstein's theory was more accurate. And this is the way that science progresses. This is the way that it, it acquires knowledge. It puts forth theories. It does experiments. One theory may last for 100 or 200 years. And then we find that there's some, some, some observations, experiments that disagree with it. We have to replace it and revise it. And, Experimental tests plays a critical role in the acquisition of knowledge in science. Well, let me turn to religion. Um, and first of all, I want to, to say what I mean by religion. And, and I'm, I, I wouldn't be presumptuous enough to throw out a definition of religion myself, so I'm going to appeal, appeal to the great Harvard philosopher and psychologist, William James, who wrote an extraordinary book called The Varieties of Religious Experience, published in 1902. And I, I recommend that to all of you. And after uh, looking at religion and many different faiths and many different cultures, talking to people, this is the, the definition that James gave of religion. Religion consists of a belief, a belief that there is an unseen order and that our supreme good lies in harmoniously adjusting ourselves thereof. I think the word belief here is important because um, religion is more about faith 
than about physical evidence and because the, the personal experience is very important in religion, and I'll say more about that in a moment. I think uh, unseen is important because most of the, the objects of religion, uh, they're frequently in the unseen world. They lie outside of the physical universe, the objects of belief. And I think the word good here, our good is important. Our supreme good lies in harmoniously adjusting ourselves to it because the word good here implies that religion includes an understanding of moral behavior. And all of that is wrapped up in this simple sentence that William James wrote about religion. Well, what are the kinds of knowledge that we have in religion? Well, I would suggest that there are, are two principal kinds of knowledge. There is the transcendent experience, and there are the writings and the content of the sacred books and the writings of theological thinkers. By transcendent experience, I mean the immediate and vital experience of feeling connected to something larger than ourselves, to feeling an order in the cosmos. The transcendent experience may or may not involve a connection to God. It may or may not involve belief in God. The transcendent experience is beautifully described in William James' book by a clergyman. And I want to quote from that. This is the, a clergyman. So this is probably about 125 years ago. I remember the night in almost the very spot on the hilltop where my soul opened out, as it were, into the infinite. And there was a rushing together of two worlds, the inner and the outer. It was deep calling unto deep, the deep that my own struggle had opened up within me being answered by the unfathomable deep without. I stood alone with him who had made me and all the beauty of the world and the love and the sorrow and even the temptation. Since that time, no discussion that I've ever heard of the proofs of God's existence have been able to shape my faith my most assuring evidence of his existence is deeply rooted in that hour of vision. And I think it's the extremely personal nature of this experience described by the clergy clergyman that gives it its power and force. The clergyman on the hilltop had no doubt about what he felt. And there is no person who can negate that experience. No matter how the clergyman tries to analyze that experience with logic, with science, with theology, or, or anything, the experience is ultimately beyond analysis. The truth and power of it lies in the experience itself. Of course, Judaism has many accounts of the transcendent experience. And one of my favorites is when Moses sees God in the burning bush. And Moses walks over to the bush, and God sees Moses, and God says, Moses, Moses. And Moses answers, here I am. And in saying, here I am, Moses is doing much more than just acknowledging his own existence. He is acknowledging his experience with God, just having seen God in the burning bush a few seconds later. He has heard God speak to him, and he's answering. To me, as both a scientist and a humanist, I find that the transcendent experience is the strongest evidence, and maybe the only evidence, that we have for the spiritual universe. And I imagine that many of you here 
probably all of you have, have had a transcendent experience. It's a very personal thing, and I wanted to tell you about a transcendent experience that I had uh, a few years ago. For many years, uh, there was a family of ospreys that, that lived in a large nest near my summer home. Uh, my daughter, Kara, is sitting on the front row, and she knows these ospreys as well as I do. And every season, my wife and I would carefully observe their rituals and their habits. Uh, in mid-April, the parents would arrive at the nest, having taken separate vacations in South America. They would, uh, the mother would lay the eggs. Um, beginning of June, the eggs hatched. Uh, the babies would grow over the summer as the father brought fish to the nest to feed the family. And then in, mid, in early to mid-August, the babies would have their first flight out of the nest. And my wife and I recorded these things with a notebook and with a camera. We, we got to know the ospreys very well. We, we wrote down how many chicks the the, the parents had each season. Sometimes there were two, sometimes there were three. We memorized the sounds that the ospreys made when there was danger or when food was coming. We, we recorded and noted each season when the baby birds first began flapping their wings, which was around two weeks before their first flight. And uh, we got to so we could predict most of what happened with these birds. And in the winter time, when we were not at our summer home, we would open up our osprey journals and take pleasure in what we had written, and we felt that we had learned something about the universe, that we had documented some, documented some corner of the universe. And then one August afternoon, the two baby ospreys of that season took their first flight. Um, I had been watching them all summer long. Um, I stood on a circular deck of my house watching them, and they watched me, and to them it must have looked like I was in my nest because I was standing on a circular deck. So we'd been watching each other all summer long. And on this particular afternoon, their maiden flight they did a couple of loops around my house, and then they headed straight for me at tremendous speed. <laughs> um, I was frightened, uh, and my immediate impulse was to run for cover because these birds were pretty big by this time, and they could have ripped my face apart with their talons, uh, with their claws, but uh, something made me hold my ground. When they were about 20 feet away from me, which is like two F-15s coming at you, when they were about 20 feet away from me, they, they did this sudden vertical climb, uh, went over my head and over the house and were gone. But in that last moment, that, that dazzling, frightened, frightening moment, for about a half a second, we made eye contact. And words cannot convey what happened in that half second. Uh, what we exchanged between us, the birds and me, it was a look of connectedness. It was a look of, of mutual respect. It was an acknowledgement that we shared the same land. And after they were gone, I realized that I was shaking and I was in tears. T to this day, I don't understand what happened in that half second. But it was one of the most profound moments of my life, and I had made contact with the spiritual universe. So that's one of my transcendent experiences. I'll say just a little bit about the content of the sacred books, which is another form of knowledge, and 
religion. Of course, there are many views about what that content actually is. Is it the direct word of God? Uh, is it metaphor? Are they the thoughts of, of inspired men and women? But whatever it is, the, the content of sac the sacred books can be inspiring. They've been the source of literature. Um, they're uplifting, and they, they do represent a kind of knowledge of the thoughts of extraordinary men and women of the past. I will say that statements in the sacred books that refer to the physical universe should be tested by the methods of science, because I feel that that, that is the domain of science. I think that there are many things that we take on faith without physical proof and even without any methodology of proof. We cannot clearly show why a, the ending of a particular novel haunts us. We can't prove under what conditions we would sacrifice our own life for the life of a child. We can't prove whether it is right or wrong to steal food in order to feed our family, or even agree on a definition of right and wrong. We cannot prove what the meaning of life is, or even prove whether there is any meaning at all. These are all questions of aesthetics, morality, philosophy. They are questions for the arts and the humanities. They are questions for religion. These are questions of faith and belief. I wanted to say just a little bit more about the distinction between the physical universe and the spiritual universe. Events in, this, in the physical universe can be analyzed with rods and clocks and rulers and, and tools outside of our bodies. Events in the spiritual universe cannot be analyzed in that way. The, the evidence lies in what we feel individually, person by person. The physical universe and the spiritual universe each have their own domains and their own limitations. The question of the age of planet Earth, for example, lies in the physical universe uh, because there are scientific tests that we can do, for example, in measuring how quickly certain rocks decay by radioactivity that can actually give a date to the age of the Earth. In contrast, there are other questions like, does God exist or is it moral to kill an enemy soldier in time of war that lie outside of the domain of science but fall within the domain of the spiritual universe? I am impatient with people like Richard Dawkins who try to disprove the existence of God using scientific arguments. Science can never prove or disprove the existence of God. If God exists, as understood by most religions, God surely exists beyond rational analysis, and God surely exists outside of the physical universe. I am equally impatient with people who make statements about the physical universe that violate the known laws of nature. I want to end with a couple of comments about the similarities between science and religion, and I think there are many. First of all, truth. I think both science and religion are seeking truth. Uh, in science, it's truth in the physical world, and religion, it's truth in the spiritual world. The experience that I had with the ospreys was a spiritual experience. After that experience, I felt that I had discovered a truth, a truth about the connectedness of nature, a truth about the unity of nature, a truth about my own emotional and psychological state. Beauty. I think this is another area that science and religion share. 
Anyone who's worked with science knows that there is beauty in science, especially in the mathematics. If we graph Galileo's law of falling bodies, it's a beautiful curve, a parabola. There's beauty in the spiritual world as well. The power and subtlety of human relationships and emotions, the feeling of being connected to something larger than ourselves, the wonder of the cosmos. These are all beautiful experiences. Some people believe that there is only a single universe, that the physical and spiritual are a oneness, a unity. This is a very appealing belief, and according to this belief, there is no distinction between the inner and the outer, between the subjective and the objective, between miracles and the rational. It's, these are appealing ideas, but I cannot accept them myself. For me, I need the distinctions between the spiritual and the, and the physical universe in order to make sense of my life in science and my life in the spiritual world. For me, there is room for both a spiritual universe and a physical universe, just as there is room for both science and religion. Each universe has its own power, each has its own domain, each has its own beauty and mystery. A Presbyterian minister said to me a few months ago that science and religion share a sense of wonder, and I agree. Thank you. You identify as a Jew, even though you uh, appreciate the contributions of many different spiritual uh, approaches. What does it mean to you to be a Jew? Well, it means uh, several things. I am proud to be a member of a group of people who had the idea of uh, a single God. To me, one of the, the, uh, the most attractive features of, of Judaism is its respect for knowledge and a life of the mind. Uh, and I also, uh, to being a Jew, it means to me, to me uh, a commitment to social justice uh, and to uh, helping people who are less advantaged than we are. But um, when I was growing up uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, my rabbi was James Wax, uh, a great, great uh, inspiring figure, and he was very active in the civil rights movement. And um, he was such a modest man, he didn't say a thing about it to us uh, in his confirmation class, but we knew that, that that's what he was doing, and we felt that that was putting into practice being a Jew more than anything that we had learned in our books. Here at JTS, uh, we pride ourselves in having been the home to two of the real giants of Jewish thought uh, of the last century, Mordechai Kaplan and Abraham Joshua Heschel. Dr. Kaplan believed that godliness uh, in this world was entirely natural, that there was an impetus toward good in nature. Dr. Heschel believed that God was a living and benevolent being whose ritual demands on us as Jews were to lead us to an appreciation of the Holy One. Heschel was, in that sense, an artist and, and Kaplan a scientist. Can you locate yourself on a, on a continuum between those two? I don't know exactly where I'm located. I never think of, of being at a particular location on the spectrum, but I do think that the science and art are um, both essential, they're both ways of being in the world, and we need both of them. One of the titles of my lecture tonight was Questions with Answers and Questions Without Answers. And I think that in the sciences that um, we're always working on a problem 
that we call the well-posed problem. Um, it's a problem that has been defined with enough precision that you know that it has an answer. Even if it might take you a lifetime to find that answer, um, in any given moment, I think that every scientist is working on a problem that he or she believes has an answer. Whereas I think in the arts, we're frequently engaged with things that don't have an answer. Um, there's no answer to a good character in a novel. Uh, and so I feel that, that we need both questions with answers and questions without answers. I think they're both part of being human. And so uh, the sciences and the arts are both vital to our humanity. What are your thoughts on deism? What are my thoughts on deism? Uh, well, of course, deism is uh, a kind of religious belief that a lot of scientists subscribe to, and uh, uh, I think it's a very attractive belief that, that, that God is in the laws of nature, God is in nature. Uh, to me, that's uh, very close to the kind of belief that I have. There, there may not be physical evidence for the existence of God, but what about the possibility of philosophical evidence uh, exemplified by the presumption of a multiverse? I don't think that you can arrive at the existence of, of God by logical argument. Um, and I believe that the, the multiverse uh, idea, which is the idea that there are lots of other universes that exist in addition to ours, um, I don't think that that requires the existence of God. I'm not trying to talk anybody out of belief in God here. I just want you all to know that. Um, I'm, I'm uh, being put into a, a devil's advocate position here. I think the, the explanation there would be just there are, there are laws, there, there is mathematics, and you can call that God if you want to. You can call the, the laws of nature God, the laws of quantum physics, but I, I don't think that that requires a design. Uh, the existence of many universes does not require an intelligent design. But just because you can uh, explain the origin of the universe from uh, the laws of quantum physics and relativity, et cetera, et cetera, that doesn't mean that God doesn't exist. See, now I'm playing the opposite side of the fence. Uh, that, that, that certainly does not disprove the existence of God because God, uh, as understood by most religions, lives outside of time and space and just proving, because you can explain something without invoking another factor does not mean that that factor doesn't exist. So the question has to do with uh, the presumption that Dr. Lightman fits in the mechanists rather than the vitalists. And given his prediction that we have the possibility to construct a human being, uh, if there is no ghost in the machine, to use your phrase, is it possible that we can create beings that have uh, intelligence, uh, emotions, and all of the qualities of human life? Well, I think it's a little bit like a chess game. We can learn the rules of chess, but that, that, that doesn't mean that we, can, that we can win every possible game because those rules lead to zillions upon zillions of of possible configurations of the board and complications. In principle, we may understand what all the moves of the chess board are, i.e. the way all the hundred billion neurons work, but I think that in practice, being able to predict the outcome and that complicated, there's an enormous, each of those neurons connects to a thousand other neurons. Just imagine, how complicated that system is. I mean, I think that the human brain is the most complicated object in the universe, uh, more, much more complicated than a galaxy. 
And even though I have a, a purely mechanistic view, I, I believe in the laws of cause and effect, I believe in the laws of nature, it's such a complicated problem that for practical purposes, I think that it will be a long, long, long time beyond what, what I can imagine before we can uh, create a computer that has that complexity to do everything that we do, which includes consciousness, includes awareness, includes making moral decisions, and so on. Whatever else religion might posit, it posits a moral code that is grounded in something that transcends the self. Mm -hmm. How, what is the source of a moral code for someone who describes himself as you do as a spiritual atheist? Oh, that's a great question. Well, first of all, I, I don't think that, that a moral code should originate from God. And the kind of God that I would believe in and want to believe would not be a God who has us behaving in certain ways, moral ways, because it was something that pleased him or her. It should please us. And I think that the moral code that one can live by uh, without believing in God is a moral code that arises from living in a community of other human beings. We have such short lives and we're, 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 we're com we come and go in just the blink of an, of an eye. And, and for me, the only way that I can find meaning in such a brief life is if I connect to other human lives, that if I feel a part of a long chain of human beings through the centuries, if I'm part of a community. And to me, a moral code arises out of honoring and respecting that community. I think that if, if our universe has any meaning at all, that it is in our humanity. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM. To GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.